Okay, welcome to week 13, uh, almost the end of the semester for science fiction, uh, English 2420 with me, Professor Ellis. I hope everyone's doing well. I hope that uh, you've been taking care of yourselves, that you're healthy, your families are healthy. Again, um, just as a reminder, if you get a chance to get the vaccine, jump on it, no matter which one it is. Uh, getting some protection is better than no protection, both for yourself and the, as well as those around you. Um, I think I mentioned before, I got my first uh, Moderna shot um, a, week, a couple weeks ago, and I'll be getting my second shot um, on May 19th, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, also, make sure you wear a mask when you're around other people. Um, you have to protect yourself as much as possible, and as well as protect others around you. Um, remember to keep me uh, in the loop if anything comes up that's going to affect your ability to do well in the class, you know, to finish the assignments. Uh, I want to help everybody that I can, um, but unless you reach out to me, I won't know that you might be needing that extra help. Um, you can also talk to me uh, if you just need someone to be a sounding board about you know, the stresses or anything you else you got going on. I'm not a counselor, but obviously um, having someone that will just you know, listen to you, I know can be a big help. Uh, that kind of you know, professors that have done that for me in the past help me out. So if I can do that for you all, I want to, to be there uh, as much as possible. Remember that you can reach me by email, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. And then also have my office hours each week on Wednesdays, 3 to 5, or by appointment. All you got to do is send me an email. Let me know what your availability is, like you know, what days and times so you're free. And then we'll try to sync up. Uh, and set a, a meeting time um, that accommodates both of our schedules. All right, so we got a lot of stuff to go over today uh, that's going to kind of set us up uh, to finish out the semester. So let's take a look at what we got going on. So first off, there's some uh, big updates. First, I want to remind you, please uh, take the time to fill out the student evaluation of teaching um, forms. Uh, you should get emails a few weeks ago um, that each that each email should have a link uh, to the form for each of your classes. So you click the link and then you fill out uh, the bubbles and there should be a place to write as well. So feedback that you can give me on the class is appreciated. Also your written feedback. You know, Let me know what things you liked about the class. Let me know things that you think could be improved. Maybe you got some ideas uh, that you want to share with me because I listen to everything. Um, because as you can imagine, each semester that I teach the class, I, I tweak and change things to try to make it work better. The version of the class that you're taking now is you know, the um, aggregation of all the different changes, feedback that I've received over the years that I've been teaching this class. And so you can you know, make your mark and help future students by giving me your feedback on the class as well. And it's definitely appreciated. It's super anonymous. I won't know you know, who wrote what. Uh, I don't get to see these until you know, after the class is over, grades are in. Um, but you know, certainly like to hear good things about the class. Um, that makes me feel good. But also, I, I need to hear you know, any kind of constructive criticism that you have as well, because that can help me make the class better. Now, more things that are directly involved with class and like what you got to do in the class. Um, so, you saw in the original syllabus that I had built in peer review as kind of a requirement for the research essay. Based on feedback that I've received from students in the class and kind of gauging where everybody is, I decided instead to make this um, uh, a voluntary, uh, non-required aspect of the research essay. So I would still encourage you to do peer review on your research essay, um, but it's not something that I'm going to be checking off or you know, grading in some way. Uh, what I'll be grading is the final research essay after hopefully you've done some peer review on it. Um, and the way we're going to do it for our class is today I want you to watch for an email from me. And that email is going to be science fiction peer review. Now, the way this will work is I'm going to send that email to groups of probably five to six students each. 
And the way it'll work is that if you want to reach out to students in the class to get peer review, all you got to do is choose reply all in your student email to that email. What that'll do is it'll send an email to everybody that is in that email that I sent out, including me, so I'll kind of be able to see what's going on. But what you should do when you reply all is write a message in which you're making an ask and an offer. Your ask is you're going to be asking those folks that are on that email, hey, if you have some time, do you think that you could read over my research essay and give me some feedback on it? And then your offer is going to be that in exchange, I will be happy to give you feedback on your research essay. I mean, this is the whole thing about peer review is that not only are you receiving this important feedback, but that you're willing uh, and able to offer that feedback in, in return. It's an exchange. Now, um, if you take advantage of this, I would recommend you doing it sooner rather than later. And the thing is, you don't have to ask for peer review over a finished uh, research essay. If you want to get some peer review feedback on what you've written so far, you can do that. There's no reason not to. Now, remember whenever you reply all, you make your ask, you make your offer, say thanks and sign your name, don't forget uh, to include your research essay that you want folks to give you peer review feedback on. Now, what I would recommend you doing is simply copy your research essay as it's written on Google Docs, Microsoft Word, wherever, and then paste it into your email below where you sign your name. That makes it easier for those other folks in the class to be able to read your work and they give you some feedback on it. That way they don't have to open it like inside, inside of a program, especially if they're looking at it on their phone or a tablet. But now you can also, obviously, attach your document to the email. Uh, you can attach it as you know, um, a Google Doc, uh, or if you've downloaded it, you can attach it as a PDF. You can attach it as a Microsoft Word doc file, DOCX file. Um, but now, what, one thing that I want to caution you about, if you are attaching your document to that email, is not everybody will have the same software that you're using to write your document. Uh, a case, you know, a case in point would be my, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Apple Pages, because uh, like if someone doesn't have a Mac, um, they're not going to be able to open that file, uh, like say on a PC um, running Windows or Linux. So. I would suggest if you are planning to attach the file, you should save that file as like say, um, it could be just a raw text file, txt, it could be a rich text file, rtx, um, and usually Microsoft um, Word DOC and DOCX files uh, can be opened pretty much by, by anything on any platform. So that's usually a safe bet. So that's in a nutshell, how to send your work out to this group of folks in our class that are going to be on that uh, email that I send to you. Now, once you receive these emails from those folks that are in your uh, cohort, uh, there's two things that you should think about in providing feedback to folks. The way I like to think about it is one, you have strategic issues that you should address, and on the other are tactical issues. So to distinguish these two ways of looking at the essays that you've written and providing feedback on them, the strategic issues are the big picture issues. This is like, you know, kind of like the way the general and the army sees the battlefield. It's like oh, everything's laid out on the map, right? You can see everything, all the different soldiers mapped out on, on the map and on the battlefield. So these strategic issues are, is this person writing an essay about a single work of science fiction? 
right? That's a big picture issue. If they're writing about 12 different science fiction um, works, like books and films and video games and everything else, well, you should probably point out to them that the assignment needs to focus on just a single work of science fiction, right? Uh, another strategic issue is what are they trying to argue in the essay? Uh, they could be arguing that the work that they're talking about is an example of science fiction. And that's great. If it seems like they're kind of going off the deep end, though, and talking about things that don't really relate to science fiction or the topic of our class, you should question them. And you can just you write in your email, you know, I, I'm not really sure what you're getting at uh, in your essay. It seems like you're not really talking about science fiction. Uh, but just as a reminder, your essay should you know, be making some kind of argument about the science fiction of this work that you're, you're writing about. Okay, So th these are like big picture issues. Now, on the other side of this are the tactical issues. Now, tactical would be more like the view of the soldier on the ground of the battlefield. The soldier doesn't see everything laid out. All they see is like what's right in front of them. It's like small things, detail things. So if we're talking about strategic issues, this is and these are things like do paragraphs have topic sentences, right? The topic sentence should tell us what that one paragraph is about. Is there a transition from one paragraph to the next so that we have that flow going from one paragraph to the next to the next to the next in the essay? Other tactical issues include uh, is there research? Like, are there quotes? Are the quotes cited, meaning they have the parenthetical citations after you each quote, the author's last name and then a page number, or paragraph number if it's like an online source? Um, is there a list of works cited at the end? And are they in MLA format? These are also tactical issues. Um, and other tactical issues include, like, Spelling, you know, are words spell right? Are there misspellings? Are sentences written correctly? Is the grammar correct? Uh, are they using punctuation right? Now, when you give peer review feedback on the strategic and the tactical issues, you know, I'm not expecting you to have to spend a, a, you know, a huge amount of time on this. So give what feedback you can. Um, and again, it's not required. But if you are asking for feedback, there is the expectation that you will be giving feedback in return. Okay. Now, in addition to utilizing this, these peer review cohorts that I will be you know, connecting via this email that I send out today, you can also ask family members to read over your work. You can ask friends and other classmates in different classes to read over your work. They don't have to be in the science fiction class. And then also you yourself should read your work aloud, okay, at least one time before you are ready to turn it in on our Open Lab site. And I'll be telling you next week how to do that. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do that this week. I'm gonna do that next week. But read your own work aloud. And this is something I tell you to do not because, you know, I'm trying to you know, make your lives, you know, a living heck on top of everything else I know that you have to do. But this is something that I do myself whenever I'm doing professional writing that I'm going to send off for publication. You know, I know it, uh, that it works because I've seen it work with my own writing. And what's key about reading your work aloud is it slows your brain down. It also uses different circuits in your brain in terms of the way that you think about words, the way you think about sentences, the way that you construct meaning from stringing words together into sentences and paragraphs, into sections and into a document. It helps you see things differently. And it helps you catch mistakes that your brain, and this, there's studies on this, okay, that whenever you read something silently, your brain can actually skip over mistakes. Because your brain will see, oh, there's a mistake here, but in your understanding of it, 
you won't see the mistake because your brain basically fixes it automatically on the fly. How cool is that? But even though that's cool, that's a problem for us that are trying to fix mistakes, right? So read your own work aloud if you do nothing else. But everybody should do that because that will automatically help you catch mistakes and make your writing better um, just by taking the time to read it aloud. And it won't take you that long. Um, just find a quiet corner somewhere, whether it be at home, uh, outside, somewhere that you can be alone, just read it aloud. Nobody's going to think you're crazy. Um, it's just a really great way to make sure that you catch mistakes in your own writing. And you can also, I mean, by extension, if you're wanting to give feedback to others uh, for peer review, you can also read their work aloud. And you'll catch things that you wouldn't otherwise catch uh, if you just read it silently. So both ways, reading it aloud helps. So that's the peer review um, of the research essays. Again, it's voluntary, highly encouraged, and uh, all you got to do is click reply all to the email that I'll be sending out. And remember to include an ask and an offer and then attach or copy and paste your writing into that email. Make sure it's a way that people can read it. Um, and similarly, I know some people might be using Google Docs, Google Drive. If you want to share your work that way, make sure that you do make this, the sharing settings correct if you're just going to include a link. Uh, because there's nothing more annoying than like you getting a link and then you click it and then it says, oh, you don't have permission to view this. And then you're going to have to request permission. Uh, so make sure you change this, the sharing settings right if you insist on doing that. Again, I don't think that's the best way. best way is just to copy your writing and paste it into that email and a person can just read it um, inside the email. It makes it so much easier for everybody. And then the person can just write you an email back. Um, and when you give that feedback uh, in return, I would suggest replying all again. Um, not just so that other folks can see that feedback that you're giving it, because it can help them think through like what kind of feedback they ought to be giving, what they should be looking at, but it also lets me know who's taking advantage of this and how you're giving some feedback to, to one another. All right, the next big update is final exam. Uh, we all knew that this was going to be coming, and the way the final exam is going to work is this week uh, I will post... The questions on our open lab site because it's a take-home exam. Uh, there's going to be roughly 20 questions. Okay. Now the way it works is again my concern is that you are learning the material of the class and you know I'm not going to have you use some kind of weird proctoring software to see if you're cheating or anything like that. No this is totally an open notebook exam. But the way we're going to do it in order to help make sure that you're getting some valuable learning, because as I've mentioned before, handwriting is guaranteed to help you remember things much better than if you're typing things out on a keyboard. And also, I, don't, I want to resist the impulse of folks like going back into their weekly uh, writing assignments and just copying and pasting things uh, into the exam responses. So for the final exam, you're going to have roughly 20 questions, and you're going to write using handwriting onto paper your responses to those 20 questions. You don't have to copy the questions into your notebook. You'll just do, write one and then write in complete sentences your response to question one. Then you'll put a number two, and then you're going to write your responses by hand in your notebook, your answer to number two, then number three, and then just write out your response in complete sentences to question three, and you're going to do all that all the way to question 20. And then, just like with your notebooks, you want to use the Dropbox app or the Google Drive app or one of the many other free and if you want to there's also paid apps that allow you to scan uh, um, documents using your smartphone I would just recommend using Dropbox since it was free 
uh, for you to use for the, you know, the two gig allotment they give you. Um, use the Dropbox app or the Google Drive app to scan your documents. Basically, you put a page down on your desk, start a new scan with the plus uh, icon inside of the Dropbox app, take a picture, move that page off, put your second page down, take a picture, and do that for all the pages of your responses. Save that as a PDF, and then at the bottom of the final exam, I'm going to give you a link where you'll want to submit your completed handwritten PDF of your final exam responses. Okay, so there will be, even though I'm talking about this now in the lecture, this will also be a post on our Open Lab site uh, that I'm going to keep up uh, toward the top of uh, the page uh, when you first go to our Open Lab site so you can see it and you won't miss it. But if anybody you is listening to me talk and can't find that final exam post, drop me an email. I'll, get, I'll send you the direct link so you'll be able to find it. But again, the final exam is about 20 questions. You will write your responses by hand on notebook paper or you know, any kind of paper. It doesn't matter. But you write it by hand. Question one, write your response. Two, write your response. Number three, write your response. Do all that all the way down to 20. Um, make sure your name's on the top somewhere. And then you scan it then that's going to produce a PDF of your handwritten final exam response, just like you were in class and you, you were writing it in a blue book, right? But instead of handing me that blue book when we were meeting in person, you're going to be uploading that to the Dropbox submission link that I'll post at the bottom of the final exam post on our Open Lab site, okay? So again, it's a take-home uh, exam. You can use any of your notes. Uh, you can even look back at your previous um, weekly writing assignments if, you've, if you miss something that you need to add into your final exam responses. But again, that final exam needs to be handwritten, new, complete sentence responses by you uh, for each of um, the questions. Okay, it's, it's going to cover everything that we've talked about this semester, but it includes stuff from the lecture and includes stuff from the readings. Uh, so if you've been keeping up with the readings, if, even if you've missed some of the readings, as long as you've been doing all your notes with lecture, uh, you will have everything that you need to knock the final exam out of the park. Okay? But if you got questions about that, let me know. Now, with the final exam, you're going to have until the final deadline in the class um, to complete it and get it submitted. Now, I think on the syllabus... Um, I'm going to go over there real quick. So here I am on our Open Lab site, and I'm going down to the syllabus so I can look at the schedule. All right, so the final due date for everything in the class is going to be Wednesday, May 19th. Okay, but now you can submit work a little late. If you need that extra time, if that extra time is going to help you excel and really do well on the work, because ultimately I want to see your best work, you know, that way you get the best grade in the class. You really can show me what you can do. Um, but one thing that I would ask is that if you can't meet this Wednesday, May 19th due date, and this was like the original due date. Uh, for everything in the class, except for the research essay, because the research essay originally was going to be due uh, week 14, but I pushed that back. I gave you extra time already, because uh, I wanted, again, give you enough time to really show me the best work that you can do. But if you need even a little bit extra time, you have until Tuesday, May 25th. But if you take advantage of this extra time, I need you to send me an email by um, Wednesday, May 19th, just letting me know. Give me a heads up. Say, Dear Professor Ellis, you know, I've been dealing with a lot of stuff. I needed just a little bit extra time to finish the exam, to finish the research essay, whatever it is you need to finish, okay? That way it lets me know that you're actively working on the assignments, 
And it also lets me know to watch for your work, okay? Because as we're getting close to the end of the semester, you can imagine right now there's going to be a flurry of emails about a lot of different things, and it's vitally important I don't miss anything. So by you giving me a heads up, it helps remind me that, hey, you know, this student is going to be submitting something late. I kind of need to watch for their name very carefully. And then also, what I'll be doing is anytime I receive something that you turn in late, I will reply, giving you kind of like a receipt, saying, hey, I received this from you. Good job. Uh, so that way you know that, that I received your work and I'll be grading it. Okay? So I just want to be clear on that. The original kind of due date for everything in the class is Wednesday, May 19th, week 15. Um, but if you need extra time, just send me an email by that date, by May 19th, letting me know what you are planning to finish, and then you're going to have until Tuesday, May 25th to get that done. Uh, grades are due that week. And just to give you guys a heads up about like how crazy this semester is leading into summer semester is grades are due on the 28th okay that's like and I'm gonna be turning them in before the 28th because otherwise if I don't um, the administration is going to be like breathing down my neck about it um, but this semester even more so than usual because summer semester begins the same day the grades are due well, that's a whole hell of a lot of problems for everybody involved because if you're a student needing a prerequisite for a class to begin the next class in the sequence, you need to get a grade for the previous class before you take the new class. Well, as you can imagine, that's causing a lot of problems for folks. So I need to get these grades in as quickly as possible while also giving you as much time as I can both to complete the work, but then also giving me enough time to do all the grading that's involved for all of my classes uh, by the deadline. So that's just kind of like what's going on in the background that I want you guys to know about, in addition to um, you know, why I've kind of scheduled things the way that I have, but then also what kind of uh, elbow room we have to work with uh, to get things in late. So you have that as an opportunity if you need it, but I recommend trying to get this in on time. That way it can just be graded and I can get those grades in for you uh, and then you'll be able to see everything, all the grades on CUNY First. All right, so that covers the student evaluation of teaching, peer review for the research essays and the final exam. Oh, and just uh, one last thing. Uh, about the research essays I alluded to just a moment ago. Again, you will be turning those in on Open Lab. And what I'm going to do, because there's been a question about like kind of what the research essay ought to look like, even though I've gone over the specifics of like, you know, um, your topic, doing research, how to do that research, uh, that it should be using MLA format. Um, but what I will do also for this week's lecture post, I'll include a link to previous student essays uh, from the last time I taught uh, science fiction at City Tech. And that should give everyone an idea about like what these should look like and also what your finished product will look like. Uh, because next week what I'll go over is how to submit your essay, your research essay, on Open Lab as an Open Lab post, which gives you some experience with publishing on Open Lab, which, as I've mentioned before, I think Open Lab is built on WordPress, which powers like a third of the internet. So, by having you do the assignment this way and submitting it to Open Lab actually gives you real experience that you can put on a resume that you know how to publish content on a WordPress site. So that means something. Like if we were doing this all on Blackboard, you know, people you know, could give two shits that you know anything about Blackboard. Because Blackboard is, is, is really just a learning platform for like schools. It doesn't have as much applicability outside of schools, in a school setting, a campus setting. But Open Lab is cool because with a using WordPress as its underlying architecture, 
when you're using it, when you're publishing things on it, you're actually getting experience for what WordPress looks like in the real world. And so you can then make claims on a resume that you know something about WordPress. Now, I'm not saying you know how to program WordPress plugins or how to design a website on WordPress or anything like that. We're starting small, just you know, publishing some content, your essay on there. But still, that's something that, that shows you know how to do something extra that maybe other applicants for a job you want one day don't have. And for me, that's really valuable because that gives you an extra chance to get that interview and to maybe get that job. And I want to see you all successful. So anything that I can do with the design of our class to help you in that, beyond like teaching science fiction, I want to do, which that, that's one of the big reasons why I use Open Lab is because I know it can matter to you once you're gone uh, into the workplace to get a job. All right, so that'll be next week when I show you how to actually publish your research essay on Open Lab. Right now, we're just focused on doing some peer review on your research essay uh, leading up to. Now, the, the thing about the peer review, it, you don't have to do it right, right this second. Uh, if, you, if you want to reply to all to that email in a week from now, you can do that. But the closer we get to the end of the semester, just to be honest, maybe you may get fewer responses or no responses. I don't know. Um, because with this being voluntary, um, you're, the ask and offer I'm hoping is going to yield some results, which is why I also recommend family members, friends, and then yourself reading it aloud. That way you give me the most polished work that you can, considering the circumstances of us not being in the same place at the same time because of the pandemic. All right, so let's continue with lecture now. And so we're going to be picking up with feminist science fiction. Uh, then we're going to uh, talk about Ursula K. Le Guin, and we're going to talk about Octavia E. Butler. Uh, and both their work and the stories that you read for today's class. And then we're going to talk about Afrofuturism. And we'll think of uh, Octavia Butler as kind of like this transitional figure who's both representing you know, as a black um, woman writer, uh, is both taking part in feminist science fiction, uh, but is also taking place uh, as an Afrofuturist. And we're going to find out what that means. So make sure you got your notebooks out, uh, ready to make some notes. And so we got Ursula K. Le Guin. You can see her name on the screen. Make sure you put it in your notes accurately, the way that I spelled it, including her middle initial. Uh, just to this is this could be an apocryphal story, but one that I heard from one of my professors at Georgia Tech years ago. Um, she was at a um, academic conference. And in her, uh, at the conference, she was giving a talk. So she has her essay that she wrote, and she's speaking in front of an audience. And it's all about Ursula K. Le Guin's writing. But as she is speaking, she keeps referring to Ursula Le Guin, not Ursula K. Le Guin. And after her talk, there is an older woman in the back row who stands up to ask a question, and she makes a point of saying, uh, I am Ursula K. Le Guin, and this is my question. <laughs> the reason why she pointed that out is that professionally, this is the way that she's known. And you, I've done this throughout our class in terms of the way that I write authors' names, like Philip K. Dick. Um, is to emphasize what their professional names are, the way that they are known professionally. And it's a, a, a sign of respect and accuracy that we follow that when we refer to these people, when we refer to these writers. Uh, so with Ursula K. Le Guin, we want to use uh, that initial um, in her name, uh, which is um, actually her... Um, family name before she was married. Uh, so Ursula K. Le Guin, the K stands for Krober, K-R-O-E-B-E-R. -E -E 
uh, just for your reference. Again, you write Ursula K. Le Guin, not Ursula Kroeber Le Guin. Um, write it the way I have it up here on the screen. Now, she was born in 1929, and she unfortunately passed away in 2018. Now, Ursula K. Le Guin won five Hugo Awards and six Nebula Awards. So, I mean, she's highly recognized uh, as an, a, a very significant and important writer in the field. Now, Ursula K. Le Guin's parents were Dr. Alfred Lewis Kroeber, uh, and again, that's spelled K-R-O-E-B-E-R, -E -E uh, who was born in 1876 and died in 1960. And he was a famous anthropologist who studied Native Americans. And her mother is Theodora Kroeber, uh, born in 1897 and died in 1979. And she was a writer well known for her anthropological book, Ishi in Two Worlds. And that's spelled I-S-H-I, -I, Ishi in Two Worlds, T-W-O-W-O-R-L-D-S. And that was published in 1961. Now, this is a, a remarkable and very important anthropological work um, in mid-century United States uh, about this person named Ishi, who was the last member of the Yahi tribe, that's spelled Y-A-H-I, who just simply walked out of the wilderness of the American West, um, and you know, it was like, you know, they're all gone, I'm the only one left. And he spent the last few years of his life um, among anthropologists at the University of California, Berkeley. And um, Le Guin's mother wrote this book about Ishii, and the reference to two worlds is like how he you know, lived in this, this world of the Yahi, but then once they were all gone, he was then a part of you know, the modern world, um, the English-speaking American um, world. And you can imagine like this was you know, uh, de destabilizing, disorienting, etc. for Ishii, and obviously um, it... it his way of reacting and having to live this experience uh, tells us a lot about the human experience, um, which again is what anthropology is about. So if you're not familiar with that word, I keep using anthropology, you can see here on the screen, this is the study of human beings and their culture. Uh, it can be about our societies, it can be about our food, uh, it can be about our languages, the way we speak and communicate. Uh, all of this is under the umbrella of uh, the, the field of study called anthropology. Anthro meaning man. So it's about studying human beings. And so I'll just add with this background of her parents, it's probably not surprising that Le Guin incorporated an anthropological viewpoint in her fiction. Now, Le Guin was well educated. She received a master's from Columbia in Romance Literatures of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And if you um, notice her birth year, 1929, uh, I mentioned this when I lectured on Philip K. Dick a few weeks ago. She's one year younger than Philip K. Dick um, if, you know, if he was still alive. Um, and Coincidentally, they were in the same class at Berkeley High School in California, but they never met when they were actually in high school. They didn't know one another. But then later in life, they connected and corresponded and talked on the phone. They became really good friends when they were both alive, uh, but they never met face to face. It's kind of, you know, you can imagine today, you know, people don't, that you can make friends online, you know, people you may never meet. Uh, but back then, it seems kind of, you know, stranger to me uh, that you could have this kind of correspondence uh, relationship uh, but never meet one another. Um, but that, that's kind of her, you know, connection with Philip K. Dick and Philip K. Dick with her. Now, her fiction has uh, these three characteristics that I want you to have in your notes. One... 
The plot of her novels usually follows this trajectory. A man in an alien or alienating world. An alienating world means like it, it may not be a world that they're aliens. They could be other human beings, but something about that world sets them out on the outside. They're like an outsider. So a man in an alien or alienating world goes on a quest during winter and during the journey makes a conceptual breakthrough that enables him to bring together disaffected groups. So the, this man serves as like a unifier. He like figures out something that is, you know, in a sense, dividing people but he figures out a way to bring these groups together. And again, this is kind of like what anthropology is about, is like trying to figure out how human beings work within groups, within a society, uh, and building connections, because we are all human beings. So even though we may have different political viewpoints, different ideas, have, you know, live in different historical eras, but there's something fundamentally human about us that can connect us together and that can provide understanding to one another. So the second characteristic you can, is that you can call her fiction anthropological. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. Anthropological, meaning that her fiction has an anthropological viewpoint. Uh, Le Guin is interested in culture, people, and politics. Her fiction strives to understand the alien other. And as I mentioned before, the alien other with a capital O, uh, and often in quotation marks, is this identification of a people or being, or even you know, another fellow human being, as being different than ourselves, that they're set apart in some way. Um, but this alien other usually, it, in, at least in fiction, is often used as a way to help us better understand ourselves, uh, as well as to better understand that experience of this person or persons that are othered, that are you know, ostracized, that are seen as different uh, than those of the, the main viewpoint of the novel, of the film, et cetera. Um, you know, a really great example, you're taking a, a, stepping away from Le Guin for a second. If you haven't seen it yet, um, there's a, a film uh, from South Africa that I highly recommend called District 9. And it's one of the best examples that I can think of of a film that really explores uh, what it means to be the alien other. So this film, District 9, is essentially about these aliens who have crash-landed on Earth, um, and they're like refugees. Um, they, they don't have anything, they, they need help, they need assistance, um, and the human beings who are seen as like their overseers um, that you know, quarantine these aliens, keep them in, in, in like ghettos, essentially, are quite racist in the way that they treat the aliens, but because of um, these events that take place in the film, one of these racist overseers um, is a, a essentially uh, infected with a some sort of substance that transforms his DNA and his body into one of these alien beings. And so then he gets to experience what it's like being the other. And we, the audience, get to experience it via what happens to him in the story. Um, so it, it's a, a quite remarkable film uh, for like being able to really see what the alien other means as a concept in, in, in a very enlightening way, I think. And, and also serving as a, uh, an allegory for uh, racism and apartheid in, in South Africa. So, returning to Le Guin, okay, uh, the third characteristic is her fiction um, is informed by Eastern Taoist, and that, that's spelled, I know I say Taoist, but it's, that's just the way it's pronounced. You spell it T-A-O-I-S-T, 
Eastern Taoist tradition more than the Western philosophical tradition. Her fiction seeks a balanced whole instead of the separation of opposites or the conquest of one part by another. Uh, with Taoism, there, there's more about um, a balance between things. You could think of like uh, yin and yang, right? Uh, and she uses a lot of these ideas in the way that she provides like a philosophical underpinning to what takes place in her stories. Now, some of her main series of stories include, uh, you can see on the screen here, the Hainish stories, or the League of All Worlds, as it's also known. And these are stories that share a common universe of a race of people who are forerunners of humanity from a planet called Hain, H-A-I-N, thus Hainish. Uh, they sent out colonies to many different worlds, and then they observe the cultural and biological changes that take place over time. And one of the innovations in these stories that Le Guin came up with is a device called an ansible, and that's spelled A-N-S-I-B-L-E. And an ansible is a device that enables faster-than-light communication. Because as you can imagine, if you've been following like any of the uh, the recent news about um, perseverance on um, Mars and any of the Mars rovers, um, is that there's a time delay between when we send commands to the rover on Mars to do things, and then the rover does something, and then it sends a signal back uh, confirming that it's done these things, and you know we're also able to see pictures and video and whatnot. And the big reason for that uh, large turnaround in time uh, is because of the distance involved. And with that distance is that you, you know, light travels at a finite speed, you know, 300,000 meters per second squared. And so with uh, light traveling at that finite speed uh, over a certain distance, it takes time. It's not instantaneous. And so you can imagine if you're traveling to distant worlds and then you that are light years apart, we're talking about years of time for a signal to go from one place to another. The Ansible is a way of avoiding that um, problem with the way our universe works. Uh, it is you're using, uh, you, you could probably explain it uh, using different types of quantum processes, but in any event, it enables... Uh, communication faster than light. So even though you might be light years away from home, when you pick up the receiver and the sending device on the Ansible, you're able to communicate right away uh, with those folks back home. Now the second series that I have here is the Earthsea um, books. And this is a fantasy buildings Roman. Let me spell that for you. B-I-L-D-U-N-G-S-R-O-M-A-N. A Bildung's Roman story is a coming-of-age story, is what it means. So, Earthsea is a fantasy Bildung's Roman, or coming-of-age story, about a magician named Ged, G-E-D. Uh, the first three novels were popular young adult and children's fantasy. The characters were people of color, and its mythology was informed by more than just European lineages of you know, magic and sorcery. Like It's a lot different than what we get from, uh, say, Tolkien. Now, some feminists attacked Le Guin for this series because it depicts men as doers and women as passive centers. So, in response to this, Le Guin wrote a fourth book called Te'anu, T-E-H-A-N-U, The Last Book of Earthsea in 1990, which is a tragic book about a savagely burned child that features the strength of women and the impotence of men in the character of Ged. 
Uh, this book won a Nebula Award, uh, but it confounded librarians across the country because its adult themes were seen as inappropriate for children, at least when you compare it to like the themes in the first three Earthsea books, which were more um, young adult children friendly. Um, so it's kind of like an outlier. But the themes, I mean, it's just, you know, exploring themes of, like, real life um, in this, this fantasy setting. Now, for today's class, you read the story Nine Lives. And it's important to note that this was first published in the November 1969 issue of Playboy magazine, which has a long history of publishing SF stories, as we've mentioned before, with um, Fahrenheit 451 by uh, Ray Bradbury. Uh, but it's worth noting this is the first, first story by a woman published in Playboy, though it was published under the name uh, U. Period, K. Period, Le Guin to conceal her gender, uh, maybe under the belief that a male audience might not read it or see it the same way if they knew that it was written by a woman. And so the synopsis of the story is on a distant mining planet, two men must work with a group of ten clones, five male and five female clones, um, who are completely reliant on themselves and on one another. It's like they almost have like a hive mind. They, they, they rely on one another as a single unit uh, in order to live. But when uh, one but when all of the clones, except for one, is tragically killed, the one left alive has to learn and negotiate social relationships uh, with his two non-clone companions. And of course, this is it you know, creates a, a problem for that um, one clone uh, to try to overcome in the story. So nine lives. Now. Let's turn next to Octavia E. Butler. Make sure you get her name down right. Octavia, uh, middle initial E, Butler. And she was born in 1947 and um, passed away far too early in 2006. And uh, just for your notes, but again, use Octavia E. Butler as her professional name when you're referring to her in writing, but just for your, your own edification, her middle name is Estelle, E-S-T-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And Octavia E. Butler uh, was the first well-known African-American woman writer of science fiction. And in in distinction of her work, she is the first SF writer to be awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant uh, and be named a MacArthur Fellow. The, 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 these Genius Grants are an award that are given out each year um, to different artists and writers and thinkers to basically uh, fuel the work that they're already known for. It's a way of providing support uh, for people that are recognized as being the best and brightest and doing the most inventive and interesting work in a lot of different fields. And no science fiction writer had ever received this grant before she did. So I mean, it's really remarkable. It really reflects highly on who she was and what she was doing. Now, I also want to note that she attended the 1970 Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop. Um, the Clarion is an annual workshop that you have to apply to go to. You basically send writing um, in advance and then the, the people that oversee the Clarion Workshop read through all the different writers uh, submissions and pick those that are the most promising, those that have the most potential to turn that writing into something great. And so she went to the 1970 Clarion Writers Workshop, and each year they have different uh, guest teachers, mentors. And this particular year, uh, someone that we've talked about a lot all semester, 
uh, was one of the mentors, and that was Harlan Ellison. And when he read Octavia E. Butler's writing, he basically said, ah, I'm not going to be helping anybody else but her. And then he worked like one-on-one -on -one with her uh, to, to develop her writing. Uh, it was also at that time that she met Samuel R. Delaney. And the way the workshop works is, is basically six weeks long, and all you do is you focus on your writing. You write, and then you workshop it, meaning you share it with the other people there who then give you feedback. They tell you what's working, what's not working, how to make it better, etc. And there's only 18 students, and you know, Octavia e. Butler was one of those 18 at the 1970 Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop. Now, the types of science fiction that Octavia e. Butler writes uh, includes time travel, uh, a lot of emphasis on biological sciences and biology, and also uh, drawing on the social sciences. So these are the three types of SF that she writes. Now, the themes of her writing include slavery, victimization, classism. Classism is, you know, uh, the way people are viewed based on, like, their socioeconomic class. Racism, and then also identity. Like, you know, what is our identity? Is like, and how does our identity get formed? And how do other people perceive our identity? You know, largely based on like, you know, our class or our race. Uh, so identity is a big theme in her writing. Now, some important examples of her work that I want you to know about, and the, the biggest that I want you to know about, is one of my favorite novels, but it's not favorite because I, I think it's like the most um, uplifting story. It's a real gut punch of a story, and it's titled Kindred, K-I-N-D-R-E-D, -E from 1979. And this novel... Um, the beginning it takes place in modern-day California. A black woman named Dana and her white husband named Kevin are hurled back in time to the antebellum South. Antebellum means before the Civil War South, where Dana is presented with a terrible dilemma. She must keep the white son of a slaveholder alive. His name is Rufus so that he lives long enough to rape and impregnate her ancestor, a black woman named Alice. So imagine, like, you, she's torn between, like, this realization that uh, this guy is essentially a rapist. He's going to take advantage of one of his family's slaves. And you would think you need to prevent this kind of violence you know, being perpetrated on someone. But she realizes, if you want to think of this as like, you know, a, a kind of a black mirror, um, nightmare version of Back to the Future, right? Where if you want to continue to exist, you have to let this terrible violence, this terrible trauma happen to um, your ancestor. Uh, so, it's, like I said, it's a very, um, you know, hard book to read, uh, and very terrible things happen to Dana, you know, because she's black, she's seen as a slave uh, in this past that she is, has to exist in, and, and her body is receives lots of scars uh, as a result of this. I, I don't want to say more than that, but definitely you should read that novel. Uh, it's, it's one of the most highly recommended books, I think, that I can um, tell you about in our class. And that goes for the whole semester. Now, two other series I want to mention uh, are the Patternist series. Uh, the Patternist series involves mutants and telepaths and shapeshifters, very popular. And then perhaps even more popular is the Xenogenesis series. 
Uh, and this is a story about alien-human hybrids. Um, and it has a lot to do with identity because like there's the identity of the human beings that are saved by these aliens that essentially invade Earth and they're given choices about like you know how they want to live and whether they want to essentially you know, mate with you know, create a child with these aliens and then the the offspring you know, what are they you know there are now these hybrids of human and, and alien biology um, and so it's you know how do the surviving humans see their these offspring and also how do these offspring uh, make sense of their own identity. Uh, it's very uh, tough issues that she explores in these, these stories. And then for today's class, you read Speech Sounds. And make sure you put in your notes that it was published in the December 1983 issue of Asimov Science Fiction. You know, Isaac Asimov um, gave his name to a science fiction magazine beginning in 1977. Uh, and it's still being published to today, even though you know, he's passed away. And this uh, story, Speech Sounds, won the 1984 Hugo Award for Best Short Story. So it's, it's a, it's a well-recognized uh, story. And so the synopsis of it is that the story is set in a post-apocalyptic world in which a pandemic killed scores of people and has crippled survivors ability to communicate with one another of those who have survived many have had neurological damage that causes them to lose the ability to speak or the ability to read and write you know, these involve your know, different parts of our brain so that's how it kind of makes sense that this could be a possibility of how this virus attacks the, the human brain Survivors also experience rage that can turn violent when meeting someone who has the power of speech or writing that they have lost. Think of this in terms of orality, O-R-A-L-I-T-Y, or spoken communication, and literacy, L-I-T-E-R-A-C-Y, or the ability to read and write. The protagonist in the story is a woman named Rye, R-Y-E, who was once a professor, but who uh, has been robbed of the ability to read and write due to the pandemic. She meets a man named Obsidian, who could read, but had lost the ability to speak. They make their way towards Pasadena, where Rye's family had lived. On the way, Obsidian is killed while he, while he and Rye try to stop a man who they witness kill a woman. Rye kills the assailant and reluctantly brings the dead woman's two children who can speak with her uh, on her continuing journey. So it's, it's I think, you know, a very compelling story uh, especially thinking about our current predicament uh, and the predicament we've lived with over the past more than a year in the pandemic with COVID-19. Uh, because you know, COVID-19, in addition to being something that can kill you by the way that uh, it destroys your lungs, is it's also been shown to do a lot of other tissue damage to our organs, including the brain. And so there are some people that are winding up with neurological conditions, both young, middle-aged, and old people, um, as a result of this virus. Uh, so it, even though this is a science fiction story that Octavia e. Butler wrote, that we read for class, um, it's also, I think, you know, very eye-opening in terms of you know, how close to reality uh, science fiction can be. And it's too bad that more people aren't reading the science fiction and thinking about it and taking the ideas seriously um, so that you know, we can plan, could plan and try to avoid the kinds of predicaments that we've been in uh, since last year. But that's the way it is, right? So 
Continuing uh, to the last part of today's lecture is Afrofuturism. And this is a super exciting part of science fiction today um, that I would encourage you all to look more into because you, unfortunately we just have a limited time in our class um, to talk about all these different types of science fiction and themes in science fiction. Um, but this is one that I think you know, may be of interest to a lot of folks in class. Um, and so you can, you know, out, you know, once class is over, you explore all these different things more on your own. Uh, and I hope that you will all be lifelong science fiction readers um, because there's a lot to offer both in terms not just of science and technology ideas, but of thinking of alternate futures, of thinking of like how we can all find equality, how we can all fit into the future, that it is not a zero-sum game, meaning that there are there has to be winners and losers, that we can reimagine things um, in a much more positive and equal way. And a lot of that is, I think, a key to Afrofuturism. So we can think of Octavia E. Butler as occupying two worlds, both the feminist SF and Afrofuturism. These aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, and can, in fact, be mutually inclusive and supportive of one another. The largely circulated narrative, uh, the narrative we ourselves used in this class, is that science fiction was developed by white Europeans and Americans in the 18th and 19th century, and people of color entered the field following the collapse of European colonialism and the rise of the civil rights movement in the United States. But the thing is, this isn't true. We know that science fiction has appeared in virtually every culture where industrialism has risen. For example, 1830s Brazil, 1860s China and Japan. What about the Afro-diasporic peoples? Afro-diasporic, I'll spell that for you. That's A-F-R-O-D-I-A-S-P-O-R-I-C. What that means is people of the African diaspora. A diaspora is a spreading out of people. And so you can imagine because of the transatlantic slave trade that there was this diaspora of black people from Africa to lots of different parts of the world because of the slave trade. They're like they've been spread out into all these different places because of that. And of course they're their, their progeny over time have um, you know, continued that, that diaspora by them you know, living in these places and becoming you know, citizens of these places. Um, so what about Afro-diasporic peoples? You know, and how does you know, their experience of industrialism and their writing and, and response to industrialism play into science fiction? So the Georgia Tech based um, science fiction theorist Lisa Yasek, Dr. Lisa Yasek, Y-A-S-Z-E-K, uh, has written on this. And she writes, quote, authors naturally turn to science fiction as the premier story form of techno-scientific modernity as an ideal means by which to critically assess new ways of doing economics and politics and science and technology. Authors of all color use science fiction to explore the necessary relations of science, society, and race to stake claim for themselves and for their communities in the global future imaginary, end quote. Uh, put another way, uh, she adds, uh, African slaves suffered the conditions of, quote, homelessness, alienation, and dislocation that very much anticipate what Nietzsche described as the founding conditions of modernity. If you want to think about black people as the primary subjects of modernity, those who have the most intense engagements with it, science fiction has the grammar that allows us to narrate those engagements." End quote. So in a sense, science fiction is the place to make sense of you know, one's place within the modern world. And of course, you know, uh, black peoples would 
you seize on this science fictional language to help make sense of their place in it, in this world. So Afrofuturism is not a subgenre of science fiction. It's an intersection with science fiction. So it you know, connects with science fiction in a lot of different ways. Now another theorist, Mark Deary, D-E-R-Y, coined the term Afrofuturism in his essay slash interview, Black to the Future, Interviews with Samuel R. Delaney, Greg Tate, and Tricia Rose from 1994. Um, and in that, he wrote, quote, speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture and more generally African-American significance that appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future might, for want of a better term, be called Afrofuturism, end quote. So more generally, uh, Lisa Yasek adds, quote, Afrofuturism is speculative fiction or science fiction written by both Afro-diasporic and African authors, end quote. So those are some good definitions that you can use uh, for what Afrofuturism is. Now, Yasek also gives us three goals of Afrofuturism that you should put in your notes. One, it should tell a good science fiction or speculative fiction story. Two, recover the past and reconsider the present in their light. Recover the past and reconsider the present in their light. And three, imagine or inspire new futures based on these recovered histories and culture. Imagine or inspire new futures based on these recovered histories and culture. So in a sense, Afrofuturism uses science fiction to make sense of you know, a people's past, their present, like they're here and now, while also trying to imagine a different future, a future that, that's obviously better than what their past and their present uh, is. Now, another um, theorist that I want to mention is Kodwo Ashun, uh, K-O-D-W-O-E-S-H-U-N. And this person writes in Further Considerations on Afrofuturism, an essay, quote, Looking back at the media generated by the computer boom of the 1990s, it is clear that the effect of the futures industry, defined here as the intersecting industries of technoscience, fictional media, technological projection, and market prediction, has been to fuel the desire for a technology boom. Given this context, it would be naive to understand science fiction located within the expanded field of the futures industry as merely prediction into the far future or as a utopian project for imagining alternative social realities, end quote. And then continuing, quote, to be more precise, Science fiction is neither forward-looking nor utopian. Rather, in William Gibson's phrase, science fiction is a means through which to pre-program the present. Looking back at the genre, it becomes apparent that science fiction was never concerned with the future, but rather with engineering feedback between its preferred future and its becoming present. End quote. So, considering Eschen, Afrofuturism is a way of short-circuiting the efforts of the futures industry to create an exclusive future. Now, to conclude, there's a, some important works uh, that I want to mention that you can put in your notes and also some names that you should put in your notes that you can look up on your own and find out more about um, after the lecture. 
So first, you can see on the far left here um, a collection. This is an anthology called Dark Matter, a century of speculative fiction from the African diaspora. And this was originally from published in 2000. It also contains essays by Delaney and Butler. And there's also a sequel to this called um, Dark Matter, Reading the Bones. And both of these were edited by Cherie R. Thomas, and both are winners of the World Fantasy Awards for Best Anthology. So uh, both of those collections by Cherie R. Thomas are um, highly recommended as um, touchstones for what we mean by Afrofuturism. Now, some of the authors uh, that I'll mention, you ought to put in your notes uh, and check out some of the things that they've written, uh, include George S. Schuyler, S-C-H-U-Y-L-E-R. You already know Samuel R. Delaney. Uh, you know Octavia E. Butler. Uh, there's Bill Campbell, a really great guy. I got to meet him in Atlanta a number of years ago, and he wrote a book uh, I particularly like called Sunshine Patriots. And it's kind of a, um, a, a great response to Robert Heinlein's uh, Starship Troopers uh, in terms of like what actually, what would the experience be of uh, future soldiers fighting uh, an alien enemy. Um, but yeah, Bill, but uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Bill Campbell uh, in his book, Sunshine Patriots. Uh, then there's Stephen Barnes, Tanner Reeve Dew. Uh, her, her first name is spelled T A N A N A R I V E, Tanner Reeve Dew. Nalo Hopkinson, and Nettie Okafor. And her name spelled N N E D I. O-K-O-R-A-F-O-R. -O -O uh, but besides science fiction and Afrofuturist writers, I'll also mention some musicians you should check out. Uh, you can see here a book about Sun Ra at the bottom row of these book titles. Uh, there's also George Clinton uh, in his associated bands Parliament and Funkadelic. Uh, there's Outcast from Atlanta and Janelle Monae, uh, who's done some really you know, uh, interesting and, and fascinating work, uh, especially I like her earlier Android Identity um, uh, suite. Uh, so all of these are different forms of Afrofuturism that I, I'd highly recommend you check out. Um, and you, if I hope by this point you do have a topic for your research essay, but if you're still like want you're not happy with what you have or want to do something else, you, this may be a way forward for some folks. That was with an example from uh, Afrofuturism. All right, so that concludes today's uh, lecture. So um, some reminders. Uh, please remember to fill out your student um, evaluation of teaching. Look in your email for those. I think you have until maybe May 14th. Check the email for the hard date on that just to, to get that in in time, sooner rather than later. Um, watch for my email for your cohort to do peer review on your research essays. Again, it's voluntary, but if you participate in that, reply all, give an ask, like you're asking for feedback on your work, Offer to give your feedback to the others in your cohort, and then, of course, copy and paste your essay into that email or attach it in some way. But if you're attaching it, make sure you use a format that is easier for people to open that may not have the same software that you're using. Um, the final exam, I'll be posting that on our Open Lab site. Roughly 20 questions. Handwrite your responses on notebook paper or on just sheets of paper that you can then scan using uh, like the Dropbox app or the Google Drive app and then I'm going to give you a link on that post to submit that PDF that you create of your handwritten uh, final exam uh, by the end of the semester. Um, and then also remember there'll be the weekly writing assignment 
uh, for uh, this week. I'll get that posted on Open Lab, 250 word summarizing lecture in your readings. And then for next week, uh, we're going to cover cyberpunk. Um, so you'll want to um, read William Gibson's Burning Chrome. And then if you can, if at all possible, watch the episode Kill Switch uh, from the X-Files. I give you a, a link on the syllabus about how to find that. Uh, maybe you know someone that has a copy of the X-Files or has streaming access to it. Um, it's, if you can't see it, it's not the end of the world, uh, but it is a really cool episode of the X-Files that was written by William Gibson, uh, and it really, I think, encapsulates what cyberpunk is about. Um, and let's see, so weekly writing assignment, peer review, final exam, research essay, complete sets, and then, uh, again, get your work in by um, the 19th, if at all possible, Wednesday, May 19th. Um, but if you need more time, just send me an email letting me know what you still need to turn in and get that to me by Tuesday, May 25th. That's like the absolute last that I can accept some work. Uh, so get in touch with me if you need that extra time. If you got questions, email me, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, remember, my office hours are Wednesdays from 3 to 5. The link is on our uh, syllabus. Um, and you remember to mask up, get your vaccines, uh, get plenty of sleep, eat well, take care of yourself and those around you, uh, and let's see this thing through. We're almost there. We only got a, you know, a few more weeks in the semester, uh, and then we can put this semester in the can and be happy that it's done. Uh, but if anybody's got anything else, just reach out to me. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, uh, and unless otherwise, uh, I'll talk to you all later. Take care.